Hello and welcome to this Astranti YouTube video on linear programming. This video will be the first in the series where I'll be going through a linear programming problem. And in this first episode, I'll be set and in this first episode, I'll be introducing the problem and then setting up the mathematical model that we'll then use to solve it. So let's jump right in and consider a company called Company F. And Company F manufactures car parts. And in particular, it manufactures part N and part M. And you've been put in charge of making the decision about how much of product N and product M the company should manufacture. Producing what combination of outputs would benefit company F the most? So by looking at the information that we have here, we can see that this decision won't be straightforward. We can see that part M generates more contribution. However, it requires four more labor hours per unit and also two more machine hours. So in order to solve this problem, we need to know what company F's situation is in terms of how many labor hours, how much material, and also how many machine hours it has available. So depending on what's in short supply is going to significantly influence our decision as to how much of both products to produce. So what if I said that company F had 300 hours of skilled labor available, 500 kilograms of material, and 250 hours in machine production time. So given these are the limitations we have on our production, is it any clearer how much of part N and part M we should be producing? Well, clearly we need to be striking some sort of balance, but it's not clear on what basis this balance should be struck. Is 300 hours of skilled labor a lot in this context or not very much? Are we a bit short staffed? It's not entirely clear just by looking at the numbers as they are. To complicate things even further, Company F has promised a customer that it will manufacture them eight units of unit M. So Company F is obligated to fulfill this promise, so no matter what combination of parts N and part M we decide to produce in the end, it must include at least eight units of unit M to fulfill this order. So this is a classic economics problem. And as it is an economics problem, we're imagining that Company F's sole purpose is to make as much money as it can. So given that these are the resources we have available, and these are the parts we can produce, how can Company F maximise the amount of contribution that it earns? Linear programming is the perfect tool to answer these kinds of questions. Linear programming is all about optimization under constraints. That is, doing the best we can with what we've got. And because of this, it's the perfect tool to solve this kind of problem. We want to do the best we can, that is, maximize our contribution, given what we've got, that is, the resources that we have available. However, if we haven't done linear programming before, perhaps the way in which we'd start to solve this problem would be to just suggest different possible outputs of part N and part M. Perhaps we should make 10 units of part N and 20 units of part M. Or maybe we should flip it around. What about 20 units of part M and 10 units of part N? So by asking this question, we've actually identified the first thing we need to consider when setting up our linear programming mathematical model. That is an objective criterion that allows us to see which of the two suggestions is better. After all, if we can't see which suggestion is better, how are we supposed to find the perfect solution? That is the solution that maximizes our contribution. So the equation that we need is something called the objective function. So all the objective function does is just calculate our contribution. Now, as our aim is to maximize our total contribution, and again, the objective function just calculates the contribution, our aim is to maximize the objective function. That is, to make the output of the objective function as big as we possibly can. So the objective function in this situation is TC, that is total contribution, equals 60N plus 80M. So what does this mean, and why is this the objective function? Well, the N and the M just stand for our component parts. So part M is represented by the little m, and part N is represented by the small m. So the reason we have 60N is because the contribution per unit for part N is 60 pounds. And then similarly, since the contribution per unit for part M is 80 pounds, we have 80M. So our contribution coming from part M will be 80 pounds multiplied by however many units of part M we make. So say we make 10 units of part M. So our total contribution from part M will be 80 pounds times 10 equals 800 pounds. That's this half of the objective function here. 
and then we multiply 60 pounds, the contribution per unit for part n, by the number of part n's that we've made. And this will give us our total contribution. And in general, the total contribution is referred to as the objective variable. And a good way of remembering this is that maximizing the objective variable is, well, our objective. So going back to the first way I mentioned of approaching this problem, of just suggesting quantities of part n and part m to manufacture. Well, we can plug these quantities into this equation, and then we can see how much contribution they would generate. Compare that level of contribution, and then decide which idea is best. However, what we haven't considered is the resources available. We need to make sure that all the suggestions that we've made are in fact possible. Do we have enough material, labour hour, machine production hours, to actually make the quantity of output that we want to. So to consider all this, it would be nice to lay it all out in a very systematic way. And that's the next part of setting up the mathematical model when we're doing linear programming. And I'll go through how we do this right now. So I mentioned at the beginning about optimization under constraints, and the constraints being the resources we have available. So the equations we're about to set up are known as the constraints. They constrain, they restrict, they limit the different suggestions that we can make in terms of the output that we can manufacture. So as a quick aside before I go into what these constraints are and why they are the way we are, just a quick word about notation. So when we're talking about constraints, what we'll see a lot of are inequalities. That is, mathematical expressions involving the following symbols, representing less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. Sometimes we'll also see a normal equal sign as well. However, for the most part, when we're talking about constraints, we will be using these inequalities. So first off, I'll explain less than. So less than is just this arrow kind of symbol on its own. So all this means is that one number is less than, but not equal to another number. So if we say less than 50, we can have 49.9, but we can't have 50 itself. Less than or equal to, in contrast, means every number that is less than 50, and 50 as well. And the difference between the two symbols is this line underneath. And a good way of remembering that this does mean or equal to is that this line is taken from the sign for equals. Now greater than works the same way, but in reverse. Now a good way of remembering which way the sign actually points to be greater than or less than is that the crocodile eats the biggest number. So if we look at these symbols in the right way, it does kind of look like a crocodile's jaws. So the symbol I'm pointing at here this would be the larger number, and then on this side, we would have the smaller number. So with this bit of notation in mind, let's now set up the constraints, mathematical ways of expressing the criteria that we need to hit when solving this problem. And we will start with labour hours. So we know from the question that we have 300 hours of skilled labour available. So we can express this as labour hours less than or equal to 300. We can use 300 hours, but we definitely can't use any more. So this equation in of itself isn't particularly helpful, so what we can do is break it down a bit further. We know that for part m, we require 12 labour hours per unit. So no matter how many of part m we produce, we can work out how many labour hours we need by multiplying 12 by the number of m that we want to make. And then likewise for part n, we can just multiply it by 8. So putting all of this together, we can express labour hours as 8n plus 12m, and this too will have to be less than or equal to 300 hours. So as we can see, this means that we'll have to strike some form of compromise. The more of m we produce, the less time we'll have available to make units of n. So we can repeat this process and set up a similar inequality for machine hours. So pause this video, grab a pen, and see if you can set up an equation like the one for labour hours, and this time for machine hours. So we know from the question that there are 4 hours per unit required to produce part n. And this gives us the 4n component of the equation for machine hours. Every unit of m requires 6 hours to produce, and then this final figure must be less than or equal to 250. We can't make any more as we don't have the time available. Now what about material? Can you see how this equation might be set up for the third constraint? So pause this video, have a go, and I'll show you the answer that I've got here. So 15 kilos go into each unit of part n, 10 units into every unit of part m, so that gives us 15n plus 10m is less than or equal to 500. So, so far, we've all considered things that need to be less than or equal to the maximum we have available. 
However, how do we express our obligation to fulfill our customer's order? They've requested that we make them eight units of M. Can you think how this equation might look? Well, the only effect it has on us as an organization is that the quantity of M we produce must be greater than or equal to eight. We can get away with producing exactly eight as that fulfills the order exactly. Producing any amount above this is our choice. So we can have equal to eight, more than eight, but just definitely not fewer. So put together, these are all of our constraints. This expresses every limitation that we have on our resources and also the obligation that we have. However, there is one more type of constraint that we need to consider. Now I'll warn you, this is a bit of a trick one. Can you think about what it could be? Well, this final consideration is called the non-negativity constraint. So this acts as a control. It just checks, is our answer sensible? So the reason I said why this one might be a bit of a trick one is that all it does is stipulate that we can't make a negative number of our product. We can make one unit of part n, we can make zero units of part n. However, what we can't do is make minus one units. And therefore, n, that is the total number of units that we produce, must be greater than or equal to zero. So this control just acts as a bit of a common sense filter. Is the answer that we've arrived at the end of our calculations a sensible one? Or have we just gone a bit wrong somewhere? So this brings us to the end of part one of this video. I've introduced the problem, and then we've also started to use linear programming tools to solve it. We've got all of our equations ready, and the next thing to do is to graph them and then solve them. This is what we'll be doing in the next episode in this series. So thank you again for watching, and I hope you'll join me in the next video.